Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue doing our overview of basic metabolism, and we're going to add in purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis and just see how they fit in. Again, we're not going to look at the whole pathways. Um, that's in other videos. We're just going to see how they fit in with basic metabolism. So let's actually do that. That was kind of weird, wasn't it? All right, so I just moved that over so we have some space. All right, so just a review here of something we talked about in the previous video. So remember one of our anaplorotic reactions was we could take alpha ketoglutarate right here and we could convert that into glutamate, okay? This is done through the action of glutamate dehydrogenase, okay? Technically, we can also convert glutamate back to alpha ketoglutarate. That's through the action of an amino transferase, also called a transaminase. And then glutamate can be converted to glutamine by glutamine synthetase. And I should have really had these flipped upside down to keep it consistent, but I think you get the idea. Glutamate is converted to glutamine by glutamine synthetase. Glutamine can also be converted back to glutamate by glutaminase. Now, one thing you should notice here is that glutamate dehydrogenase, glutamine synthetase, and glutaminase are allosterically regulated. And so there appears to be some really tight regulation here between alpha-ketoglutarate and glutamine. There's a reason for that, and it has to do with the fact that uh, between glutamate and glutamine, we have purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis intertwined. Let's first look at purine biosynthesis. So to start out with this, we actually need this compound called ribose biphosphate. So when we make purines and pyrimidines, we have to have the ribose ring, right? So the ribose ring ultimately comes from ribose biphosphate here from purine synthesis, and that comes from the pentose phosphate pathway. And then ribose biphosphate has to be converted to this compound called phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP. And this is done through an enzyme called ATP phosphoribosyl transferase. Notice that that enzyme is allosterically regulated as well. And then we have this enzyme called glutamine PRPP amidotransferase, which uses the amino group of the glutamine R group, and it condenses it with phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. And this gives us a molecule called phosphoribosylamine, which continues on through many enzymes which are not allosteric to form the initial purine called inosine. And then from that, you can get adenosine and guanosine, so A and G. Okay. So what you see here is that we've got a couple allosteric enzymes right off the bat, and they seem to be connected with this series of allosteric enzymes from alpha-ketoglutarate to glutamine. So right here, this is an area of really tight regulation. So that's purine biosynthesis. That's how it actually fits in with the citric acid cycle over here, very close by. So now let's look at pyrimidine biosynthesis. So over here, here's oxaloacetate. When we have a surplus of intermediates in the citric acid cycle, we'll have some extra oxaloacetate. And there's an enzyme called aspartate transaminase that can convert uh, some of this oxaloacetate into the amino acid aspartate. Aspartate will be used in pyrimidine biosynthesis. Additionally, we're going to use ammonia. Now here's what's interesting. Glutamine, when it reacts with glutaminase, yes, it forms glutamate, but one of the waste products, so to speak, it's not technically waste, is ammonia, NH4+. Now, this ammonia can be converted to carbamoyl phosphate by the action of this enzyme called carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. All right? Then carbamoyl phosphate will be combined with aspartate by this enzyme called aspartate transcarbamylase, sometimes just called ATCase. And that gives us this compound called carbamoyl aspartate. So that's interesting. We use oxaloacetate from the citric acid cycle in the form of aspartate, and we use the ammonia that comes off of the reaction of glutaminase, and indirectly that's going to form carbamoyl aspartate, which is the precursor to pyrimidines. Now, there's no other allosteric enzymes in this pathway, but this will be used to form cytidine, uridine, so C's and U's, and then from uridine we can get thymidine, the T's for DNA. All right. Now, again, what we see here is coming off of glutaminase, so to speak, 
two additional allosteric enzymes, carbamyl phosphate synthetase is allosteric, and aspartate transcarbamylase is allosteric. So associated with both purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis, we really have two allosteric enzymes right off the bat. And in some way, those allosteric enzymes are connected to the system right here between alpha-ketoglutarate and glutamine. So again, this area of metabolism right here is extremely tightly regulated. And so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis fit into the context of basic metabolism. There are other videos I have on my channel where we actually go into the pathways in a lot of detail, so make sure to check those out. But for now, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.